And now we proceed to the keynote address. Our keynote speaker is a highly decorated academician. He is none other than Dr. Ronald Alan S. Mabunga. Dr. Mabunga is the current Vice President for Research, Planning, and Quality Assurance of the Philippine Normal University. With almost 30 years of service at PNU, Dr. Mabunga has held numerous administrative posts, including Dean, College of Graduate Studies and Teacher Education Research, Director of the Center for Planning and Quality Assurance, and Director of the Center for Linkages and Extension Services. He was also the former National Coordinator of the UNESCO Associated Schools Project Network in the Philippines. Dr. Mabunga holds a doctorate degree in conflict resolution studies from the Nova Southeastern University, Florida, USA, as a Fulbright Scholar. And he has completed his master's degree in multicultural studies from the University of New England, Australia, as an Aid Scholar. He graduated cum laude with a degree of BSE in social science from PNU. Dr. Mabunga has extensive professional and research experience in the areas of conflict resolution studies and conflict management, quality assurance in higher education, educational leadership and management, and social science education. He is also a senior ACUP accreditor and an international assessor for the ASEAN SHARE project in 2018. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pride and pleasure to present our keynote speaker, Dr. Ronald Alan S. Mabunga. Dr. Luis O. Amano, Vice President for Research, Development, and Extension. Dr. Rebecca Rosario Obercasio, Director Center for Teaching Excellence of the Bicol University. Other officials, faculty, and staff. May also greet the Director of the Publications Office, my colleague from the Philippine Normal University, Dr. Maripaz Morales. Other presenters. In this conference, guests, ladies and gentlemen, a pleasant day to everyone. I'd like to first uh, extend my warmest gratitude to Dr. Amano and Dr. Bercasio for inviting me to deliver a keynote address uh, for this sixth regional conference on promoting world-class education. I am so honored and privileged to be invited in this um, conference. Sustaining quality assurance in teaching and research in the midst of the pandemic um, is my topic for this keynote message. Um, in this message, I'll provide some review of the global directions that we need to consider, um, along with some regional directions that um, we need to think of uh, when we are implementing our education programs and even our research uh, projects. And then I'd, I'd, I'd like to uh, put into context as well the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, both in education 
and research in general? And then what have been the responses of the different agencies um, in charge of education, particularly in the Philippines? And then look into the QA aspect uh, of um, sustaining um, the quality and the standards of our teaching and research in the middle of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. When we are talking of the uh, global directions, uh, we cannot help but talk about the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the, the 17 uh, goals to transform our world you know, from goal number one, no poverty, to goal number 17, uh, which is partnership for the uh, for the goals. And in particular, uh, we talk about quality education, which is the goal says ensuring inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. And according to the data, to the report um, prior to the COVID-19, progress towards inclusive and equitable quality education was already very slow or too slow, with over 200 million children um, still predicted to be out of school uh, by 2030. And they're saying also that inequalities in education have been exacerbated or has, uh, yes, have been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. In low-income countries, according to the report, children's school completion rate is only 34% in the poorest 20% uh, of households, as opposed to 79% in richest 20% of the households. And these are other implications of the COVID-19. You know, the closure of the schools um, kept 90% you know, of all students um, out of school. And, and this has also impacted as well um, our own Filipino students. Remote learning, um, according to the report, remains out of reach for at least 500 million students globally. And even prior to the pandemic, in a study by um, Vladimirova and LeBlanc in 2015, they're already arguing that when you're talking of quality education, particularly in, with re, in reference to SDG number four, you need to consider many other factors you know, from health, gender, peaceful and inclusive societies to growth and development, to climate change, inequality, and so on and so forth. If you are really to, to advance and promote quality education, that it is not, um, that there has to be a holistic approach, a comprehensive approach in uh, advancing and implementing quality education. And this was even prior to the pandemic. So how much more um, should, should be uh, prioritized then um, now that we are in the pandemic? In the Southeast Asia, uh, I, I took note here of the priority areas of the Southeast Asian Ministry of Education uh, Organization or CIMEO, uh, where they have identified seven priority areas from 2015 to 2035. And such areas uh, are all focusing, of course, on, on education, reforming teacher education, harmonizing higher education and research, adapting a truly 21st century curriculum, and so on. And while we have those UN Sustainable Development Goals globally, and we have the CIMEO uh, targets or priorities within the region, um, comes uh, COVID-19. And so, like according to the report, as of March 10, according to the World Health Organization, um, confirmed cases um, has already, ha, have already reached more than 117 million, with more than two and a half million uh, reported deaths or casualties. And in the Philippines, as of March 10 as well, we have more than 600,000 cases with more than 12,500 deaths. And unfortunately, uh, it kept on, it keeps on increasing. And this is another data showing where the Philippines is uh, compared to that of India, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Nepal, Myanmar, and Sri Lanka insofar as COVID is concerned. So given all this context, you have all this, that directions, the global directions, the UN Sustainable Development Goals on one hand, and you also have the regional goals particularly that of CIMEO. Of course, there are other goals, like if you talk of UNESCO, we can even include that. And then you have those goals in the middle now of the COVID-19 pandemic. So how do you reconcile that now? Um, and how did we respond uh, to these challenges? For the Commission on Higher Education, in terms of uh, the implementation of higher education programs, 
CMO number four, uh, series of 2020, talks about the guidelines on the implementation of flexible learning. And so all um, higher education institutions implemented the so-called flexible learning, which is uh, a combination of synchronous and asynchronous and other blended forms of, of learning. Others have even using uh, modules um, in, in the implementation of the flexible learning. At the Philippine Normal University, our flexible learning um, is a combination of synchronous, asynchronous, and the use of modules, particularly for our undergraduate students. For the Department of Education, uh, DepEd Memorandum Number 67, Series of 2020, um, issued in October last year, uh, provided the guidelines on the implementation of alternative learning system programs in light of the basic education learning continuity plan. So there is this learning continuity plan uh, for all basic education um, schools. And I understand that insofar as the private sector uh, is concerned, they also have their own uh, flexible learning plan or learning continuity plan implemented in 2020. So you have, the, you have the responses of the higher education uh, and also the responses of basic education. The question now is how do you sustain quality assurance? How do you sustain quality assurance in the implementation of flexible learning? How do you sustain quality assurance in the conduct of research um, among higher education institutions in particular? According to Harvey, just a review uh, of some of the basic concepts in quality assurance. Assurance of quality in higher education is the collections of policies, procedures, systems, and practices, which could be internal or external to the institution. Um, and they are all designed to achieve, maintain, and enhance quality, quality of all the services, both the academic and the administrative services. So what is quality assurance in particular? Uh, it checks the quality of processes or outcomes. There are a variety of purposes for quality assurance. Out of compliance, could be control, could be accountability, could be improvement or enhancement of the services or the programs. It also refers to the collection of different methods on how to check, maintain, and enhance quality uh, in the different processes in a given institution with certain tools and instruments that are made available for such um, uh, checking or monitoring. And quality assurance could be uh, done at different levels. It could be, at, can, it can be done um, at the institutional level, at the program level, and at the course or subject level. Between quality and standards, so what do we mean by standards? Standards are measurable indicators and are used with means to compare and assess things. Uh, there are certain criteria. Quality, on the other hand, does not have a standard concept because mostly it refers to the processes of education or to the process of education. How are things done? How, how are the lectures um, being done, for instance? That's still according to Harvey. According to him, there are five quality concepts. Um, quality as exceptional or excellent. So the main target is to exceed you know, the high standards. Quality as perfection or consistency. Uh, which is kind of developing some kind of a culture of perfection and consistency in all the services and programs that are being offered by an institution. Quality as fitness for purpose, meaning the judgment uh, judged by the fulfillment level of purpose. Quality as value for money, how efficient, how effective are the services or are the processes in the delivery of education. And quality as transformation, which is almost like an endless process um, to improve uh, all services in an academic institution. So when, when we are to focus on quality assurance in higher education, we talk of so many things. We talk holistically of QA in terms of the QMS or the quality management system, higher education management in particular, what are the tools and procedures that they are using, uh, how do they ensure the quality assurance in teaching and learning, and how about the role of the information management in ensuring or in, in making sure that um, there will be an integrated or integrative uh, management uh, of all the information in an academic institution. Perspectives on quality uh, vary you know, uh, depending on the stakeholders, depending on the perspectives of the different stakeholders. If you're the students, quality is about what's the use, you know, practical use and usefulness 
of everything that the university or the college is is giving them for future employment, uh, also with personal fulfillment. If you are a professor or a teacher, uh, your the focus of your quality is the processes of learning. Uh, how do you ensure that the students are learning? If you belong to the management, so it's basically looking at what are the achievements of the institution, whether such achievements are tangible and intangible, vis-a-vis, -vis, for instance, strategic plans or strategic directions. For the alumni, they're looking at job opportunities as the focus of quality. If you are an employer, you look at the competence um, and capabilities and qualities of the graduates that you are taking in for employment. For politicians, they are more interested into numbers. They're more interested into um, the number of graduates, the numbers of alumni, percentage of passing rate, and so on in, in board examinations, for instance. But for the entire society and community, um, focus would be, are, we, are these institutions producing ethically and socially responsible individuals or citizens? And at the same time, the society is expecting, expecting education institutions to produce new knowledge to cope with the present and future challenges, especially right now that we are in the middle of the pandemic. Very quickly, I'm not going to discuss uh, all of this, but just to show you how, how uh, comprehensive the, the concept of quality assurance when you're talking of academic institution uh, is concerned. You, you have here the, the level, no? uh, the output, the outcome, and the impact. So for instance, for lectures, the output, the expected output students will pass the exam. The outcome students with knowledge and skills on topic of the lecture. The impact students successfully master the final exams and of course the graduation. So there are different ways of looking holistically when you're talking of quality assurance in a particular program. Here is another uh, perspective. They were saying that there are four broad types of standards in higher education. Standard. You have the academic standards, which relate to the intellectual abilities of the students. You have standards of competence relating to the technical abilities of students. You have services standards, referring to the services provided by the institution to the students. And you have the organizational standards, principles and procedures by which the institution assures that it is providing uh, the appropriate learning and research environment um, in the institution and among the students. That was from Harvey in 2012. And so Nicholson in 2011 uh, was arguing a common criticism of quality assurance is that pays little attention to educational processes and educational theory and or student learning. And as a result, improvement or enhancement becomes only incidental. And, but if you look at the overall picture of quality assurance in teaching and learning, you can see here that there are two major paradigms or two uh, critical paradigms that have been mentioned. You have on the first column, you have the instruction paradigm and the other one is the learning paradigm. The instruction paradigm being the, the, the traditional perspective and you have the learning paradigm, which is the new perspective when it comes to education. So just to provide an example here, in terms of mission and purposes, you provide and deliver instruction, transfer of knowledge, offer courses, and so on. But in the learning program, in the most current uh, perspective, when you're talking of mission and purposes of academic institution, it's not delivering instruction, but producing learning, eliciting students' discovery and construction of knowledge, creating powerful learning environments, improving the quality of learning, achieving success for diverse students. So QA in the past, was looking at this, but QA at the moment are looking, is, is already looking at this, the ones on the, on the right column. The criteria for success, for instance, you know, that learning varies, there are the inputs and the resources, quality of entering students. But if you look at this, look at the criteria for success here. Learning varies, yes. Learning and student success outcomes are being looked into already, along with quality of exiting students. Here, you look at the quality of entering students. The entry requirements are the more is the more uh, uh, more important than that of the exiting students. But here in the learning paradigm, the quality of exiting students becomes even more important. So just just some examples. Here are other parameters in terms of teaching and learning structures. You know, um, atomistic parts prior to a whole. So on the other hand, when you're talking of the learning paradigm, it's more holistic and comprehensive whole prior to parts. You know, learning are held constant and time varies, learning environments and so on. 
um, in terms of learning theory. No, knowledge exists out there. That's the that's the original or the traditional perspective. In the learning paradigm uh, perspective, in terms of learning theory, knowledge exists in each person's mind and is shaped by individual experiences. Knowledge is constructed, created, learning is nesting and the interacting of frameworks. Um, so learning is student-centered and controlled, active learner required, but not live students required. So there's that, that paradigm shift, so to speak, from the instruction to the learning paradigm. Here is another one in terms of the role, for instance, nature of roles. Faculty are primarily lecturers. Faculty and students act independently and in isolation. Teachers classify and sort students, um, homogeneous, heterogeneous groupings of students. Um, any expert can teach line governance, no? independent actors. On the other hand, on the learning paradigm, you have faculty are primarily designers of learning methods and environments. Faculty and students work in teams with each other and other staff. Teacher, teachers develop every student's competencies and talents. All staff are educators who produce students, uh, produce student learning and success. So there is that element of empowerment, empowering learning is challenging and complex. There's a shared governance and teamwork um, among the different uh, independent actors. So those, that's, the, that's the paradigm shift. Uh, looking at the quality. And of course, the shifting, uh, we've seen this um, in terms of industry from industry 1.0 to um, industry 5.0, according to McClellan. Uh, and also you have heard of the society 1.0 to society 5.0 from society 1.0, the hunter-gatherer society to agrarian to industrial information and the super smart society, according to Kaden Ren in 2020. Uh, so this is an example, another way of showing the transition from society 1.0 to society 5.0. Uh, that's 1.0 to 2.0, 3.0 the industrial society, and then 4.0 information society. And then of course you are entering society 5.0. And they're saying right now that we are heading, if not we are already here, into the so-called society 5.0. We talk of big data already and making use of big data you know, the cloud uh, technology and so on as basis for solutions for better human life so that's that's what they're talking in society 5.0 um, you have the current information society that we have as well you know, 4.0 the cyberspace the cloud computing and so on the so-called physical space uh, in different aspects but when you talk of society 5.0, you have the cyberspace as well, but you have, you're talking of big data, artificial intelligence and so on. So how, how, how can education and how can education institution cope up with such changes in the society? And here is how education adjusts or uh, adapts to the different situation. So you have education 1.0, uh, this is education 3.0 to education 5.0, more on innovation and making use of all the, the industries and the technologies that we have, according to Sedilio and others. Um, 3.0, education 3.0 to education 4.0, and then to 5.0, this is 5.0 actually. So structured content learner-centered activities, education 4.0, emerging sense of ownership of own learning, but when you're talking of education 5.0, they're saying learner-driven learning, learners as agents of their own learning, learners as partners and collaborators, seamless learning not bounded by weeks and semesters and location. That's what they're already talking about when you talk of education 5.0. Personalized learning pathways, professors on demand. Now, in other words, they're not, they're not, no, they're no longer just confined in schools, but it seems like they're more mobile and they're making themselves more available anywhere, according to uh, Slicer in 2019. And you, you, you've encountered also ideas like the future skills, the future of learning and higher education, according to Ellers. And according to that, there are future skills, skill profiles, and they have identified 17 profiles through qualitative analysis. And its profile contains several competencies. So you can see here, it's quite small learning um, 
uh, literacy, self-efficacy, self-determination, self-competence, reflective competence, up to communication competence. So 17 profiles, 17 competencies that need to be addressed in the future because these are the future skill profiles. And talking of planning and research, for instance, you have the idea slot of, from Slaughter of the foresight planning for research as well. You have possible future, might it happen? Plausible future, could it happen? Probable future, how likely is it to happen? Um, you're also talking of probable future, how likely is it to happen? And preferred future, what do I want to happen? So there are implications of research you know, in possible future, research in plausible future, research in probable future, and research in preferred future. And lastly, I'd like to just share with you uh, what we intend to do uh, at the Philippine Normal University when we talk of quality assurance. And this is a framework of quality assurance at the Philippine Normal University. This is this is still a, uh, a work in progress. We are still trying to develop this, um, but more or less, this is how we intend to do it. You have all the inputs here as the NCTE law, the National Center for Teacher Education law, uh, mandating PNU as the National Center for Teacher Education. But we have to consider all the other ASEAN and other external QA standards, the profile of the university, the VMGO core values, you have to consider also the ASEAN quality reference framework, the Philippine qualifications framework. How about the customer requirements and global trends and societal needs? We have to address all of them. And as inputs to whatever we wanted to do in terms of ensuring that quality assurance is present in all instructional services, in research services, extension, student services, administrative services, human resources management, capital resources management and financial management and at the center there, crucially playing its role is actually leadership and governance. And the goal is to produce these outputs, satisfaction of the, from the stakeholders, attainment of the VMGO, quality programs and services, attainment of whatever strategic development plans that the institutions uh, institution has, and the, the university contributing to the Philippine education and began. So um, in, in, in summary, um, this is how we intend, how we uh, envision um, uh, quality assurance to be implemented in, in, in at the Philippine Normal University. Let me end by sharing with you some thoughts on education. This is um, a recently, uh, in a recent conference presented education up from Ms. Audrey Azule, the UNESCO Sec Director General. At a time when countries are making difficult choices and trade-offs to turn societies around, education must be our top priority, our pillar for recovery. And yet only a minuscule share on average less than 1% has been set aside for education and training in national stimulus packages, especially right now in the middle of the pandemic. Finance and financing education, according to her, is not a cost. It is our most crucial long-term investment. If we do not allocate this funding now, we will face a bleaker future, bleaker than what we are seeing at the moment. And finally, um, education and the future of work, according to Michelle Weiss, um, for long life learning, um, which is a new one as well, if colleges and universities fail to launch graduates successfully for the first time around, how in the world will they be able to support the 20 or 30 more job transitions to come? Um, because of the, 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 fa the very quick and fast uh, advances in information and communication technology, our access to knowledge and, and all these skills and, and, and um, information become, uh, becomes very much closer and closer. To, to each one of us. Of course, there's that question of the digital divide there, but then at the same time, um, institutions, academic institutions should be able to not just sustain the quality assurance, but making sure that what they are still offering will still become relevant, not just now in the present situation, but in the near future, or at least um, in the next 10 years or 20 years. That's why um, futures thinking becomes even more critical right now in, in sustaining quality assurance in teaching and research in the academia. 
I think with that, uh, I'd like to thank everyone. So thank you. Um, I hope that I was able to give some some inputs uh, that would more or less trigger your interest um, on how to sustain quality assurance in teaching and in doing research. So maraming salamat po. Magandang umaga. Stay safe, everyone, and God bless. Thank you. Thank you very much. And congratulations to Bicol University for organizing this sixth regional conference on promoting world-class education. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mabunga. That was an information field keynote address. He specifically talked about educational paradigms, the transition of society from society 1.0 to 5.0. He also talked about education uh, 3.0 to 5.0, among other things. He also mentioned future skills and the learner-driven education, seamless learning, learners as collaborators and professors on call. And of course, as an exemplar, he talked about the quality assurance framework of Philippine Normal University. That was an interesting and information field uh, message Dr. Mabunga, thank you very much from Bicol University and from all the viewers of our conference. We are willing to entertain one to two questions. Dr. Mabunga is here with us right now and may be willing to respond to your queries. Only one to two queries, please. Okay, we still don't have some questions from the viewers. I think I can uh, shoot one question for Sir Ronald. Hi, Sir Ronald. Um, you talked about the future thinking framework. Uh, what? Uh, <laughs> What possible research topics or research agenda would you suggest to our teacher researchers who are viewing the conference right now so that we will be able to address what you are saying a few minutes ago about future uh, thinking framework? like the quality of graduates that we produce and the competences that they possess will not only be relevant at present, but also in the future, like 10 years from now or even more. What suggestions can you give to our teacher researchers? What topics do you think will be most relevant or appropriate to conduct at this time of the pandemic? Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Uh, Rebecca. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, my apologies. I'm actually attending the executive committee meeting right now. So I just uh, come out of the boardroom. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to once again thank Bicol University for inviting me to this, um, to this forum, to this conference. Uh, I am very much honored to be uh, part of this conference. And I'm quite grateful as well because one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Paz Morales, um, will be one of your plenary speakers. And um, being a research expert, actually, she would be able to provide more answers to that particular question. But on my end, because when you're talking of futures thinking, um, and in particular to, you, to, to the question that you raised, uh, Dr. Bercasio, I think it's, it's important to look into the current situation, the current practices that we are having in terms of the implementation of flexible learning. And the current implementation of flexible learning is actually a combination of synchronous, asynchronous sessions, and even blended, uh, blended uh, modalities. In other words, others are using modules uh, for their uh, teaching. Now, the opportunity for teachers and for researchers is basically to look into the 
possibility of sustaining this kind of practices? How do we sustain flexible learning, the, the implementation of flexible learning program addressing the current strengths, the weaknesses, what are the opportunities and threats? In other words, a simple SWOT analysis for me would provide very good inputs to teachers and administrators whether or not the present practices that we are doing in terms of flexible learning should, is, uh, should be sustained. And if it is to be sustained even after the pandemic, okay, if it is to be sustained even after the pandemic, then what, what are the features? What will be the features of the flexible learning program? Here at TNU, we are already reflecting on the idea, contemplating on the idea of uh, sustaining particularly in the graduate level, sustaining the flexible learning program. And what do we mean by that? Because we are doing synchronous and asynchronous, we may continue doing that even after the pandemic, uh, which means that perhaps the face-to-face -face will, be very, very, will be very much limited as opposed to the online uh, modality. But we have to get data first. In other words, that's where research will come in. If we are to sustain this practice, what are some of the factors that we still need to, con to consider in the future? What are the problems and challenges that we may um, encounter in the near future, like a year from now, two years from now, five years from now? But at the same time, it's also important to look into the future of education. What, what will the future be when it comes to basic education, and when it comes to higher education. If you are in basic education level, um, the current practices of using modules, for instance, with the Department of um, Education, should it, should it be continued? What are the challenges right now? What are the problems? And how can these challenges and problems be addressed? These are very potent research uh, areas that teachers can, can consider or teachers may consider. And for the administrator side, they may want to look into all the different resources that they need to consider. If we, we are to continue this practice, the implementation of flexible learning program, what support services uh, would we need like five years from now? What, what hardwares and softwares do we need? What other support mechanism do we need to uh, do we need to put in place? How about monitoring and evaluation? Like right now, um, just one more note. I think one other potential topic that teachers and researchers may consider is monitoring and evaluation of what we are doing right now uh, to determine whether we are really hitting the quality that we intend to have for our flexible learning program. I think it's a big challenge right now, particularly in basic education, uh, whether or whether we are still providing quality education two to our students. And I think that's not just in basic education, but even in higher education and even in graduate education. Um, I think those are some of my answers for now, uh, Dr. Bercasio. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Babuga. I hope the viewers got that. We have listened to a very comprehensive response and we have listened to different researchable areas for you to consider. Once again, thank you very much, Dr. Ronald Alan Mabunga, Vice President of Philippine Normal University for planning, research, planning, and quality assurance. And at this juncture, we would like to excuse Dr. Mabunga, who is attending an executive meeting right now, and we will be presenting to him our certificate of commendation as keynote speaker. Once thank you. Again, thank you very thank you much. And uh, good morning, Dr. Mabunga. So the certificate reads Bicol University Center for Teaching Excellence in partnership with Bicol University Higher Education Regional Research Center and Publication and Knowledge Management Division under the Office of the Vice President for Research Extension and Development. Certificate of Commendation is awarded to Dr. Ronald Alan S. Mabunga in recognition of his meritorious participation as keynote speaker 
on the theme sustaining quality assurance and teaching and research in the midst of the pandemic during the sixth regional conference on promoting world-class education held on March 15 via Facebook live streaming. Once again, there you go, our keynote address by none other than Dr. Ronald Alan S. Babuga.